Boy, Patty, I don't know about you, but I thought this was a pretty exciting episode with this crazy interview we had about chatbots and payments. Oh, yeah, really cool. I mean, talk about um, the evolution, right? Yeah. I mean, the evolution of ordering and paying. This is such cool stuff, guys, that... Uh, if I were selling, I'd be out there, you know, talking to Michael. I know. Right? And, and it's funny. I think people might see a title or, or the beginning here and think this is going to be a fluff, you know, futuristic thing. It's really not. It's actually really it's practical here. stuff you can sell tomorrow. Yeah, it's here and it's real. Very cool. And then tell us about the insiders report. Uh, we're talking about P2P payments and how that uh, the P2P uh, networks are uh, eyeing the merchant point of sale. Love it. And then uh, in the end, uh, your questions from the field, I answer a question from an executive about what is a sales manager. And I talk about, you know, transitioning from this uh, view of a largely negative role where the sales manager is always the accountability person of, you know, negative, 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 you're going to lose your job. How do we transition to a positive approach where we're helping our team set ambitious goals and achieve them? So, Some really um, great insights you provide there too, James. Uh, manager, you know, uh, sales managers should really listen and so should their uh, superiors. Awesome. Thanks, Patty. Well, I, I'm excited about this. Let's dive into our uh, interview here. Let's go. Welcome to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Hey, everybody. Patty and I are joined today by Michael Richardson. Michael is the president at Your Host. How are you doing today, Michael? I'm doing great, James. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I'm really excited about our conversation today. Michael and I have been in contact for, I don't know, maybe even a year, um, mm -hmm. talking about this idea of chatbots, you know, messenger and texting, and this idea of being able to make orders via chatbot and how payments integrates into that. So I think it would be a very kind of futuristic but also interesting conversation about what happens today versus what could happen. But before we dive into all that complicated stuff, Michael, give us your background. How did you get into this? How did you end up you know, founding this Your Host idea? Okay, that's a good question, James. I'll be very brief. Um, about nine years ago, after being in the industry of car industry for about 20 years, I was in finance. I started working as an agent for a company called Elliott Management Group, yeah, sure. which is the first first payment uh, uh -huh. company. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I ended up, my first year, <laughs> I was ranked and awarded a top two in the nation. Nice. Wow. And, and Elliott uh, Group's nice a pretty start. big, that's a pretty big company. So they get the number two <laughs> yeah. spots, not too, not too shabby there. Yeah, I think we uh, ended up like 242 mids that year. Right. Wow, uh, that's awesome. New, new mids. And oh. um, I, after the success, I was wanting to learn more and more. So I, I started to do some research and I found a company that was doing a um, an 80-day, 80-hour uh, um, workshop on ISOs and agents. Okay. So it was out in D.C. I flew out to D.C. and spent some time out there with them. And it was there when I learned about the five, over 594 different interchange fees that right. are available to customers. I'm like, oh, my gosh, there's so many ways to make money and save money, save customers money as well. But upon completion of that workshop, I learned about DTI's cash discount program. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is even better. Right, <laughs> so right. About, this was about 2016. And when I, so I dove into that very, really, very early. So yeah. when I finally made it back to Austin, my whole focus, because in Texas, we can't surcharge. Right. So right. Uh, my whole focus was cash discount. So right. I started everything out with cash discount. So I told you that to tell you this. So um, around this time last year, uh, we're all sitting, watching the news and everything's going, you know, crazy. Then they shut things down. I saw my right. residual go down. Right. right. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. What are we going to do with this? Right. And I was already working on a few things with my developer on um, online ordering and uh, right. uh, uh, full-size kiosk systems because everybody was moving into those uh, yep. touchpad kiosk systems. Sure. And we were trying to figure out a way to uh, still pro provide the same service, but nobody wanted to touch a kiosk anymore or anything like that. So we looked at different ways to uh, research what people are actually using they're still using their cell phones. Right. So uh, we want to provide the same service as a kiosk on their cell phones. And that's okay. actually how it all began. Hmm. Oh, interesting. Very interesting. So do you mind if we let's let's get to our main topic, which is mm -hmm. chat bo chat boxes, mm -hmm. which I, you know, well, the term I kind of uh, have grown to, uh, accustomed to is conversational agents, mm -hmm. right? Um, they're software applications that mimic the written or spoken word. Just was hoping, you know, and, and since, you know, when James told me that we were having this interview, I did some research because I 
you know, didn't realize until I did my research how often I've used a chat box. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I wanted to, you know, maybe for our listeners who may not be as uh, educated about this, you know, can you explain, you know, what it means and how the technology works in general and why it's so popular right now? I mean, I think you made that point in your opening question, but maybe mm -hmm. if you could elaborate a little more. Okay, so basically on chatbots, uh, we've all used them. Right. If you go to any website these days, they're going to have a little uh, messenger in the corner say, hey, how can I help you? Right. So we want to be able to provide that user experience even when someone goes to a website and just search around. Right, right. So we wanted to right. take the chatbot um, technology and build on it. Because mm -hmm. if you, most people use their phones for texting and right. to... In order to do what a text service would do for a, with a, a, to compare with a chatbot or online ordering, mm -hmm. just for example, it takes a lot of memory to do a chat. I mean, a text sure. to provide, provide the same service as a chatbot. So we built a custom chatbot service to be able to provide those different um, customizations that you can actually offer uh, with an interactive ordering system. But okay. a chatbot, in short, um, is just a, a pre-programmed system that will communicate with the user as if you were there yourself working directly hand in hand with them. Yeah. Right. And, I, and, and it I, leverages okay. AI to do that, correct? I mean, correct. it has to sort of uh, mimic conversational speech and so forth. Correct. Right. Well, and, and I think it's also really important to, you know, let's zoom out even a little further here and I'll, I'll kind of do my best as well to, to see if I sure. can elaborate a bit. Right. So, you know, the chat bots, there's different, there's different types of chat bots, obviously. Right, Michael. So, mm -hmm. you know, some chat bots are just purely programmed. You know, it's like a person is saying, here is this decision tree or these different options. Let me give an example. We did a chat bot uh, maybe a couple months ago, people in my Facebook group, I wanted to give them a free download of an ebook, but I wanted to collect their email address. Correct. Right. So I did a chat bot where it sent this message out or actually I had a link that they clicked from the, from the group that said, do you want this free ebook? They clicked the link. It put them over in a messenger. It automatically sent them a first question that said, "Hey Bill, um, thanks for requesting my ebook. What's the email address I should use to send it to?" Then the chatbot is expecting an email address, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Grabs the email address and then sent it over to our email system and added them to our email list. Um, and then it comes back and says, um, "Are you ready for the ebook now?" And they click yes or no. If they click no, it says, "What else do you need?" You know. So then they click yes. Then it gives them the ebook. So, you know. The chatbot can be like that. The AI stuff is really cool where it's basically, you know, having more of a conversational style. But I think for a lot of merchants now with online ordering, it, most of it is going to be kind of programmable stuff, right? Whether it's like, do you want, you know, what food do you want? I want a hamburger. Well, here are the seven modifiers for the hamburger. Which do you want? Is that is that kind of a somewhat accurate description? And maybe you can elaborate more on that consumer experience for doing an, an online order through a chatbot. Yes, yeah, so that's the, exactly right. Given the the user the interactiveness that they don't get when they just go to a regular website and just got to pick around and search for what they want to choose. Right. But mm -hmm. offering those options provides an interactive conversation with the customers. Right. Right. So, so what is that experience like? So, I'm a uh, I'm a customer. I'm in the mood to buy pizza, and mm -hmm. I go to one of your I find one of your merchants on. Facebook or on their website and what happens next? Give us a little bit of that consumer experience. What, what happens? How do they order this pizza using the chat bot? So a good question. So if they order a pizza using our chat bot uh, through Facebook messenger, for example, it'll just click get started mm -hmm. uh, on from their web, Facebook messenger page right. and it'll offer different types of pizzas, pizzas, not just a list of pizzas, but images as well. Right. And they could be, uh, gift images, video, or however you want to present it to be able to provide that visual for the customer. And they can pick and choose modifiers very similar to if you were ordering on a point of sale system. Right. It's just, it's so in a conversational were, style. Yeah, it's a conversational style. Right. So they so might, they might. And says, do you want pepperoni on that pizza? Correct. Yeah. Um, it, it'll give you a list of all the options you can choose and you can choose them and it'll add it up and tally all up at the end. Um, yeah, I, I really like it. I think it's I think it's so interesting because, you know, at first glance, it seems like kind of a complicated thing to, to make into a conversation. But I went through the demo you sent me and mm -hmm. it's surprisingly streamlined. I mean, and it really does make sense. I think there's definitely some situations where more streamlining will be, you know, will take place over time. 
But mm-hmm. I mean, I felt like it was a pretty, pretty seamless consumer experience. Um, so at the, you know, at the end of this process, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, this order is then going to be sent to a point of sale system. I know we had talked recently about your, you know, looking at integrating and things like that. Can you talk mm-hmm. about kind of the end of the process? So more of like the merchant experience. So somebody makes an online order, do they like pay through the chat bot and then it goes to the, to the point of sale? How does that work exactly? That's another great question, James. Uh, what happens is uh, after the order is complete, it brings it to the end of the order. It'll ask uh, specific questions like modifying questions, any special orders that you want to present with the order, like uh, requests, mm-hmm. uh, extra that they'll charge for. Mm-hmm. Um, and it'll also upsell for a tip at the time of checkout. It'll redirect it to um, either a cash checkout or a uh, credit card checkout, electronic checkout. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if they choose um, cash, you get a cash discount, of course. Right. Uh, and that's available. And it goes from there. It pushes directly to a point of sale system mm-hmm. um, using um, uh, softwares like Otter and InstaCheckmate, who we partner with to help us to integrate with s- several different type of point of sale systems. Mm-hmm. But if we have a client that does not have a point of sale system, we also developed this little machine here. A kiosk, okay. Yeah. Um, receives the orders here and okay. it prints every receipt as they come in. So you don't have to go in and um, as the quarters, orders come through, they automatically print. Right. And they just keep the orders. They, they don't have to go back and re enter it into their point of sale system. It comes through paid for and ready to prepare as soon as the orders come through automatically. And, so and it goes so- from the customer customer cell phone directly to the point of sale system or this machine okay and is that machine so that machine then uh includes all of the particulars that then the price is added to the point of sale or does that machine integrate with the point of sale so this this machine here particularly is if you don't have a point of sale whatsoever at all Uh and you want to have the order go from your customer's cell phone to your location Mm -hmm. it comes here and just completely prints already paid for and, and I you have think, a dashboard, you log in and uh, see all your orders. For those of our listeners that are just on audio, let me take just a second to describe what he just showed us there. So we were Thank looking you. at a, a device. It's a terminal. Um, it looks like a miniature kiosk. It's kind of like an iPad Air size device that's kind of standing on end. Um, and then underneath of it, it has a little printer. Um, that's pretty slick. It has a very small footprint, um, you know, about the si- footprint of a kitchen printer, I would say. Um, but the yes. context of having the touch screen. So I like that. The other thing I want to give a little context to that you mentioned here. So this solution that you have developed, it integrates with something called It's a Checkmate. Um, mm-hmm. And the website is it's like I-T-S-A checkmate.com. It's a checkmate.com. And you may not be familiar with it, some in our industry, but it's actually pretty powerful. Um, to give you a couple of examples, it integrates with Micros. It integrates okay. um, with... Actually, even like DoorDash stuff can come in through. It's a checkmate as well. Uber Eats and all that comes in. So this is kind of a, a an integration system. Um, there's a bunch of different point of sale. I think it even does. Um, does it integrate with Clover? Do you know, Michael? Yes, Clover is one. And the one that I don't really particularly care for is Toast. As Toast, well. right. Um, <laughs> but even some of the big names in our industry, Spot On, Clover, NCR Silver, um, Heartland Restaurant, um, Revel. Uh, so anyway, if you go to it's a checkmate.com on um, paradise POS is another really popular one with cash discount reps. And as you mentioned, this has cash discount built in. So, um, mm-hmm. so very interesting. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a very interesting system that, you know, that it's able to do all of this, uh, all this integration. Um, and I think Patty had a follow-up question as well on some of the merchant stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering, Michael, what's the value prop for merchants? I mean, a lot of merchants, you know, since the since last year, only last year started going online. <coughs> excuse me, with mm-hmm. online ordering systems. You know, why should they offer a text to order um, opposite? You know, option. I mean, what's what 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 does it what does it do for them? This your host system versus regular online ordering. Mm-hmm. It it enhances the online experience. So, if they already have their online system set up, it'll integrate directly into their online system automatically and provide the user a better experience. Is there so, a lot of integration for that part of it? No, it's really just a copy and paste integration. Okay. Okay. So it's really simple, mm-hmm. and by doing this, it helps those customers of ours, our merchants, maintain those uh, customers as their own. 
So by collecting that information, yeah. as James mentioned, when he sent his chatbot out, you get to maintain that that customer is your customer to remarket to that customer later, send specials, um, or whatever you want to do to keep that customer your customer. Because when you're dealing with third-party um, delivery companies yeah. like Uber Eats and DoorDash, those are their customers. Right, and they right. don't get to retain those customers. And the benefit is that. It's, yeah, it's a they, really strong benefit for that. And I would also suggest, and I know we've talked about this in the past, that when merchants, especially small restaurants, are using DoorDash and the like, there's always there's always mistakes. There's always oh, yeah. problems. And it yeah. doesn't it doesn't go back to DoorDash. It goes to the restaurant. Right. Yeah, the consumer I'll, I'll, doesn't perceive that as DoorDash's problem. They, problem. they perceive right. it as an error on the restaurant's part. Right. I want to piggyback on what you said. I personally uh, performed a Uber Eats order, uh -huh. and I was not um, satisfied with the fact that I couldn't do any modifications. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And when we're developing this, I made sure that we could offer as many modifications as possible so we could have the experience if they were ordering directly from a wait staff. Right, and right. That's why, yeah. So what you're saying then is that it really gives the uh, the business more control over the ordering process and keeps them as their customer. Great. It's not, yep, that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So I think, you know, to me, and I, and I do want to take one step back before we get to kind of why ISOs and agents should do this. And I want to take one step back and I want to summarize what we're, what I think I've heard so far, Michael, because yes. again, I think this conversation is, is not our normal <laughs> conversation on the podcast. It's definitely touching on a lot of things that you and I are very familiar with, Michael, and, and Patty has done some research, but our listeners are not familiar with. So mm -hmm. let's take a step back for a second. So um, I have a pizza shop. I'm a merchant. And I have my Clover point of sale system or my Paradise point of sale system. And mm -hmm. I want to set up online ordering. So there's several different ways I could do that, right? One way would be I could leverage a platform like it's a checkmate. And I could right. give them the integration to my point of sale system, which is going to pull all my pictures and pull all of my descriptions and my names and my modifiers. And it's going to pull all that out into an online experience where someone can go on their mobile device, go to my this website, this hosted web page, and they can choose what they want and they can make their order. We've all experienced this. What you've mm -hmm. built, correct me if I'm wrong, is... Um, a primarily in Messenger, a Facebook Messenger, someone can click a link from that same website that says order in Messenger, or they could even more conveniently run maybe a Facebook ad that says place your order now with our staff or with our team or our bot or whatever. And when they mm -hmm. click that, it takes them into Messenger and they have to click get started to give permission to use the messages. And then it's going to take all of that same images and descriptions and modifiers, and it basically converts that into a conversational format. Right and asks them what they want to order, the modifiers that they want. Then once they're done, they select if they want to pay with card or cash, which is facilitated and then integrated into the point of sale system or into your standalone order station that you have, which would be for a smaller merchant. And it spits out and says, this is the order that came in. So then they would create that order and it would be for pickup or delivery. Did I just say everything Correct. right? Only one thing that we did not mention in that scenario is because uh, in, in Texas, we were one of the first states to reopen back up. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you go to a restaurant and order now, a lot of people uh, use QR code scans to scan a PDF of the menu. Yes. But our system, instead of pulling a PDF of the menu, it pulls up on your host ordering system. So you get an order directly okay. from the table the same way they could do online, but it's still a conversation. Mm -hmm. And the wait staff becomes a runner versus taking your order. Right. 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 Yep. Sure. I really think this idea, you know, just in, in general, the concept of consumers want to order from their phone rather than with a waiter or calling in on, you know, over the phone or ordering online, mm -hmm. you know, and the idea right. of just using their phone in a really convenient conversational way, um, I think is incredibly you know, going to be very popular. I think it's going to be a, a, just a very normal thing in 24 to 36 months. Uh, and, and so it's, you know, interesting ground floor. And I, I actually think even it's a checkmate is an interesting by itself. I mean, a lot of merchants are like, look, you know, we're going to do DoorDash, we're going to do Uber Eats, but we don't, we, we want to have our own option, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a checkmate integrates all of those things together as well. So I think there's a lot of interesting things there. So now let's now talk about the agents and the ISOs. So I'm an agent or I'm an ISO, I'm selling Clover, I'm selling Paradise or, you know, whatever it is. Why would I want to offer my merchants this, this chatbot service? Well, we mentioned uh, earlier in one of the other questions of the value to the merchants, um, the, the merchants being able to maintain their um, the customer base. But you mean what's in it for the agents, right. correct? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So the the agents 
they they have another tool <laughs> to right. uh, create more mids for their customers. Because right now, if you're competing with uh, Uber Eats and DoorDash, that's 30 to 40 percent of your rev volume right. that you're losing every month. Yes. So by being able to provide a system that can compete with them, that's adding more profit to your monthly volume. And plus, there's a, a component where they can actually make uh, residual monthly uh, revenue off of the service itself. Right. So you're so the the merchant is paying some kind of a, a monthly fee in order to have mm -hmm. this chat bot online ordering. Is that right? Correct. Yes. And you're saying and the they get a residual would, from that. I'm correct. sorry, James. No, you're fine. Yeah. So they would basically have a buy rate, or they get some kind of percentage, or some correct. way they would share in this revenue. Um, mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, let's talk about payments a little bit more because we kind of glossed over that. But I want to be really clear. So. This solution you're talking about is a processor agnostic technology, right? Yes. Okay. And so how does that work? So let's say, let's be really specific. So I'm a okay. merchant. Uh, I have Clover, which means I have first data. So let's just a really specific example everybody's familiar with. How does that work through the chatbot? Is, is, does the payment go through the point of sale system in some way? Or how does that work exactly from a payment perspective? So uh, with our system, uh, how we have it set up right now, they provide us with a VAR sheet. Okay. And we put the merchant information in and create a, they create a, a separate uh, mid for that account. And okay. so we can batch and uh, process those payments separately. Uh, and they go through our system, then to just a checkmate, then to the restaurant. And is there, I'm just out of curiosity, and you may not have the answer to this off the cuff. This is kind of a complicated question maybe, but why this separate mid? Is there, is there a specific reason for that? If I don't want a separate mid, do I really need that? Mm, yeah, that's an interesting question. It's, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, just from my experience and what I've learned, um, because there's two separate batches, there's been a problem with uh, if you batch on the same mid, yep. there's a duplicate batch. And you can't, and you can't track it. Yeah. Okay, got right. it. So, so it's, not, it's not necessarily a technical constraint, I wouldn't think, as much as you don't want the batches to get all confusing because you're batching mm -hmm. from two different systems. So, right. okay, cool. Yeah, I got it. Um, wow, that is, it's very, very interesting. What are you seeing? I'm just, last question. I'm, I'm really curious, like, what are you seeing as far as the reaction? You've obviously talked to a lot of merchants about this, and now you've probably seen this play out with consumers. How, what's the reaction like? Oh, I mean... It's been amazing. Uh, honestly, I've, I've always wanted a tool that I could use that the customers will get excited about. Yeah. So I mean, I, I still, uh, I'm, I still go out and, and sign clients myself too. Yeah. And I, yeah. I like the, the the feeling, the action, the, re the reaction that they give me is it's cool. They like it. They're like, wow, this is different. Right. And a lot of them have had uh, some issues with some of the third parties and providing another option yeah. where mm -hmm. they can control their money. For example, um, if you're dealing with a third party. Uh, without name dropping which ones they are, some of them hold their money for 30 days. Right. With our yeah. system, yeah. Can, uh, by pro providing them with a merchant ID number, they get their money faster. Yeah, it's just a batch. Right. Yeah. So that so cash flow is another concern. I didn't even think about that really. It's not just that it's not just that maybe DoorDash or Uber Eats might be taking thirty percent of the money. It's also that mm -hmm. they're not even giving you the money in for thirty days sometimes. Right. Yeah, that's a big deal. I mean, you try to hit payroll and things like that, and and you have that mm -hmm. problem. So especially um, for your small small restaurants, you know, like a sandwich mm -hmm. shop or burger joint. I mean, yeah, yeah, they they have to meet payroll every week if they're right. not getting their cash in. Right. What are you seeing from consumers? You know, uh, maybe you're hearing some feedback from merchants about their customers. If you know when a merchant does implement this, I mean, are people trying it out? Are they using it? Oh yeah, they're using it. It's actually I got a little small little funny funny story. One of my agents, before it became one of my agents, <laughs> they were actually they used the system and ordered on it. <laughs> really? No idea it was it was ours. Right. Um, and they told us the story once they came up like, well, hey, we use this at one of those locations. We thought it was one of the easiest ordering systems we ever used. Yeah. And it was like they were they were really blown away with it because they didn't know it was ours when they first used it. Yeah. But, I, I, yeah. I mean, I have to say, as a consumer. I was never keen on the kiosk idea, mm -hmm. um, but this, I would use this in a heartbeat. Yeah, because it seems like the kiosk was kind of an unnecessary middle step in a lot of ways yeah. from from this like very personal experience to this like just on your phone, simple right. experience. It seemed like the kiosk was like, let's find some middle ground. And it almost mm -hmm. seems like what, you know, this technology you're talking about is kind of like, let's just leap over that middle step and just go to what the customer actually wants, which is they just want to use their phone. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I think it's I think it's super interesting. Another thing, uh, feedback I heard from my clients, they it helped them turn their tables faster sure. because they didn't have to wait for the staff to come back yep. to collect payment. 
Right. Payment was made. Yep. They can turn the tables a lot faster. I like it. Hey, one other last technical question here. Um, so we we you know we, I just want to clarify because earlier we did use the word texting. I'm sure that down the road, you know, you could add a lot of different any kind of messenger system, whatever. What is it currently oh. allowed? Does it currently allow text oh. or is it just messenger? I'm glad you asked the question. So yes, every location that we set up, we provide them with a keyword. Okay. Uh, so, let me back up just a little bit. So the chatbot has several different ways it's activated. It's activated directly online, okay, through the web page, through Facebook Messenger, through um, a keyword by texting the keyword of the name of the restaurant or whatever we choose, and it responds and it um, communicates through text already right now. And also, we have uh, on location, we've created uh, RFID tags that are on the tables as well. If they have uh, NFC, they can just tap and it activates the chatbot as well. Hmm. So it's tap to activate. That's sweet. That's yeah. very good. So to clarify, cool. clarifying for our listeners there. So we have this conversation. It's taking place in a conversational type setup. We'd be familiar with like a Facebook messenger, but of course Correct. this also would be text messaging. And it sounds yes. like you're saying also like a chat feature on the website. Um, that's kind of separate from that. So that's really cool. I actually didn't know that. I thought it was just exclusively Messenger. So that's pretty cool. Oh, no. You got it with chat. It's no, that's chat. slick. Yeah. With text. It's a anything. chat, but on your website, existing website. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, what, I, what, I, what I thought was really cool is when you could just tap to uh, yeah, NFC. activate it. And yeah. the NFC, it's, it's, it's really a nice, yeah. cool feature. I love it, man. That's that's really cool. Okay, so I know a lot of our listeners, especially I would imagine some ISOs, not to mention some technology companies that are probably ready to 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 uh, acquire you. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, if people want to learn more about you and your company and reach out and things like that, where would you send them to learn more about this? So I would send them to um, a text. They would text sell your host. That's S E L L U R H O S T to 833-575-1039 and it'll respond with all the information that they need. Could you repeat that one more time? There might be people that uh, need to take out a pen. Sure. That is sell your host. That's S-E-L-L-U-R-H-O-S-T to 833-575-1039. And they'll give them a taste of the technology immediately as well. Uh -huh, so cool. when you said sell your host, that was all one word. Yeah, that's all one word. All one word. Okay, so, got it. Yeah. Awesome, man. I love it. So cool. People get a chance to try out a chat bot and uh, see how it works for them. So cool. Well, Michael, thank you so much. I think it was a very interesting conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time to share with us. Yeah, thank really you enjoyed it, Michael. Me. Thank you, James. Thanks, Pat. So, Patty, today we're talking about Valor, the official sponsor of our podcast. Um, you know, we talked in the interview, I believe that was last week, with Valor directly. And one of the cool things we touched on was the remote login and the mm -hmm. ability to do tech support remotely where you can just log into the merchant account. Um, you know, having sold merchant services myself and having to deal with all these phone calls where I'm, I'm really flying blind, I have no idea what's actually happening on the terminal. I thought right. that was pretty cool. I, I did too, James. In fact, it kind of reminded me of a story you once told one of our early podcasts about yeah. how you were in church and you got this call from somebody and you had to like, you know, say, Christina, I got to go and, right. you know, rush out and, you know, go. And it, it, it was a five minute fix. Yes. And that, right? it, that happened to me. Well, actually, you know, it's funny. One time, I even a better story than that. So yeah, that was a real quick fix. I can't remember what it was on now. I think it was a I can't either, but I remember error. you saying, and you know, yeah. it, it only took me five minutes, but I had right. to drive there for a half an hour. <laughs> One yeah. time I was actually on vacation at a lake house. I was about, this is eight years ago. I was like three hours from a merchant because I was <sighs> like on vacation and Ooh. it was like a 12 location merchant. And they reached out and had this issue with their terminal that if I would have had this technology to go in remote, I could have fixed it, you know, remotely, mm -hmm. but I didn't. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I literally had to get in my vehicle and drive three hours. I drove to like, I think it was at four of their 12 locations. I went into each one. It took me 60 seconds. Oof. I fixed Oof. it. I turned around. I drove back. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. I mean, you know, having that remote access thing is just so, so critical today because is. time is money. You it know? is. It is. So I think definitely agents and ISOs like definitely need to check it out. I've said it again. I've said it many times. I'll say it again. You know, if you are selling a standalone terminal to a merchant and it is not Valor, okay, I do mm -hmm. think you should check it out. They really have some cool yeah. features. ccsalespro.com slash Valor, V-A-L-O-R, ccsalespro.com slash Valor, V-A-L-O-R. Definitely go and check it out. 
and uh, you know you get a you get a free demo. It's a great demo, and uh, I think you'll be as impressed as James and I have been. And now, here is questions from the field with James Shepard. So Patty uh, had a really interesting consulting call with a large company uh, that is starting up kind of a new division. It's a technology company that's getting into payments. I do a lot of that kind uh -huh. of stuff now. And um, we were talking about one of the, my favorite questions I got was from, they had their three sales um, executives on the call, VP of sales, et cetera. And right. they said, James, in your mind, what is the role of the sales manager? So they're going to be hiring these sales managers or promoting from within. And they said, what is the role of the sales manager in your mind? And I was like, Wow, what a great question. I love that because I think my vision of a sales manager is diametrically opposed to what most people think of. Yeah. Um, to most We've discussed this in the past, too. You yes. sort of talked about that. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm interested in what you told them. Yeah. So, so most people, when they think of a sales manager, they think of someone whose job is actually largely negative. Um, they might not describe it that way, but in, in practice, their job is largely negative. What I mean by that is most of their interactions revolve around taking underperformers and negotiating mm -hmm. accountability with them to help them be able to keep their job. Okay, sure. That's a pretty good explanation of 75% of what most managers spend their time on is they're putting out fires. They're saying, oh, this person's not selling. I better go help them. This person's not selling. I better go help them. I might have to fire this person. I'll have to talk to them and maybe they'll convince me that they can keep their job. And they do a lot of this kind of stuff. And um, this is largely a complete waste of time. Okay. In sales, there are people who can sell and there are people who can't. There are and people you don't who want are, to waste your time on the people who can't. Right? Absolutely. And then there are people who are lazy and then there are people who work hard. And you can beat your head against the wall all day long, but somebody who's lazy or somebody who can't sell, they're not going to be successful. Um, they may rise to your minimum expectation because yeah. they don't want to lose their job, but that's as high as they're going to go. Their ceiling is very, very low. Mm -hmm. So what is the job of the sales manager? Here's what it is. Number one, you eliminate the negative almost entirely with policies and procedures. So mm -hmm. we have a policy and a procedure that says, if you don't walk into 20 businesses a day and record them in the CRM, the first day you get a write-up, the second day you get a, a second write-up, the third day you're fired. Done. Now, right. that removes lazy from the equation. You have to take prospecting action, right? Now, again, maybe you have a 1099 team, and this is different. Maybe in that case you say, if you don't submit a deal to us over the course of 30 days or 60 days, then we don't fire you. You're a 1099 contractor, but you're not part of our active team anymore. But there's got to be some kind of a line in the sand to say, if you want us to put time and resources into you, you've got to take some kind of action. And if you don't, there is no conversation about it. There's no exceptions. Right. It's just over. There's a right. minimum expectation, and that means we actually enforce the standard of behavior. Otherwise, you're gone. Right. So sure. then if that's taken care of with policy and procedure, well, that just freed up 75% of the sales manager's time. What does he do? What does she do with this? Well, the sales manager's job then, their job is to work with the sales team. This can be 1099 or W-2. This part of the job is the same either way. Their job is to work with the sales team to help the sales team establish their own individual goals and then to serve that sales team and help them achieve those goals. Achieve the goals, sure. So this is where people say, James, what's the difference in you know 1099 and W-2? Well, I could get into all that and there are some differences and I actually promised a few episodes ago that I would get into this from the sales rep's perspective and we will get to that. But today what I want to talk to you about is in this area, there really is no difference. So a salesperson, a good salesperson is going to set aggressive goals for themselves. Usually the sales manager is helping them to take their, their, you know, take their goals down a little bit. A good salesperson, you say, you know, how many sales are you going to sell next month? What's your goal? 25. And you're like, well, you've been selling four every month. You know, how are you going to do 25? And if you start breaking down the numbers, what the sales manager needs to do is they need to understand the underlying activities and assumptions that make these goals right. possible. So they say, well, right. You made four sales last month. How many contacts did you have? They say, well, last month I had, you know, 50 contacts, okay? And so you had four sales out of 50 contacts, so you closed at 8%. Okay, great. So if you close at 8% and you want to close 25 deals, that means you're saying you're going to make... Yeah, you're going to make about 250 contacts, you know, about that 235 uh, contacts this next month. Now, the question is, how many doors did you walk into in order to get to the to those 50 contacts? Well, I walked into 150. 
So you so it took for every three doors, you got one contact. Okay. So you're gonna get 235 times three. You're gonna need to walk into 900 businesses or 800 businesses. Um, mm-hmm. Over the course of the month, you have 20 days, so you're going to walk into 40 businesses a day. Okay, Can so you do that. The sales manager says that's what you're committing to, so they don't accept. Well, I'm going to get 25 deals. No, 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 no. that's that's meaningless. That what matters is, are you? And they say no, no. I'm going to close a lot higher. How much higher? You closed at eight percent last month. I think I can close at 40 percent. No, 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 no. You closed at eight percent last month. What are you going to close at? Twelve? Like, and how are you going to do that? What sales book are you going to read? What training are you going to go through? How are you going to increase this, right? They say, well, I was I walked into three businesses a day last month. This month, I'm going to do 10 a day, okay? What are you going to stop doing that's going to free up that amount of time for you to do that? So the sales manager is asking the difficult questions and helping the sales uh, person to establish these goals, get them into writing. Then they track those goals throughout the month. And after the first four days, they reach out to the salesperson and say, hey, I know your plan was to walk into 20 businesses a day. Um, I see you've only been walking into 10 a day for the last three days. Should we adjust your goal now that we see you're not planning to take the activity you said you were going to take? Three days sure. in, that salesperson is going to say, uh, well, no, 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 I, I really am going to do it. Okay, when? You're going to start tomorrow? You know, you're going to start today? You know, so I tell you what, tomorrow, do me a favor just to help you. I, this isn't my goal for you, Mr. Salesperson. This is your goal for you right? So since you're saying you're going to do this, how about tomorrow? Why don't you shoot me a text after you walk into your 20th business and let me know how it went, right? Well, now they have some accountability, accountability, right? Yes. And now it's like, oh man. So again, we're not dealing with the lowest common denominator. We're not dealing with the minimums. Their goals are obviously going to be above the minimums because if they can fall below the minimums, they're fired or they're no longer active depending on if they're 1099 or W2. So what matters now, the salesperson is motivating them and saying, let's be realistic. Let's set some ambitious goals, but realistic goals. And then the question is, what can I do to help? So far, I see you're closing at 12%. You wanted to close at 20, right? Um, can I, right. I can I recommend a sales book that I think would be great? How about you read the sales book and let's talk every week for 30 minutes about the chapter that you read to see what ideas we have of how we could apply this to selling our you know, Zoo's mm-hmm. a point of sale system or whatever, right? So the sales per the sales manager, she is serving her sales team by helping them establish realistic but ambitious goals that mm-hmm. they that they are their goals, not her goals, their right. goals, right? Then she's breaking those down into assumptions to make them realistic, then tracking the underlying assumptions and working with them on a on a day-to-day basis to say, right. let me serve you to help you hit your own ambitious goals. And that is what I think a sales manager is. Great advice, James. Thanks. Thanks, Patty. This is the Insider's Report with Patty Murphy. So, you know, James, as the uh, resident payments maven at Green Sheet, I sometimes get some questions from people. You know, ISOs and agents are like, why should we care about P2P payment networks like like Venmo? Right. You know, right. and, you know, and I think we've said before because it's sort of like an entryway. And I found a, the FDIC recently did a report on on Americans banking habits. And um, I thought this was really interesting. Nearly one in three Americans with bank accounts have used a payments, uh, you know, a P2P payment service. Mm. Uh, that's a fairly significant number. I actually, you know? I actually thought it would even be higher, but I mean, that's interesting. I mean, I, I know I've well, used two or three Again, of them, but... that's of those with bank accounts. If you do everybody, right, it right. would be a little bit higher. Right. Because a right. lot of unbanked, quote unquote, people... Um, use their debit, you know, they have a prepaid debit card right. that they Venmo with. So it's probably closer to 40, right? but still, it's still, it's you know, a lot. It's, a, it's huge. It's yeah. a lot. I it's mean, huge. And, and especially when like what, five years ago it was zero. So it was zero. And in fact, you know, a lot of people started thinking, you know, why, why are we doing this? <laughs> you know, I mean, right, a lot of right. banks were like, why are we doing this? I mean, Zelle, which was created as a competitor for Venmo, took years to take off. Yeah, um, yeah. Of course, it had some problems with its name, too. It wasn't it originally, I think they originally called it ISIS. Oh, no, really? Yes. I and didn't then know the that. whole ISIS thing happened. <laughs> In fact, 
I uh, still have like they gave me one time they gave me like a whole set, you know, like a notebook and a pen and, and, and a pen and a hat or whatever. Really? I still have the ISIS pen. Do you which my, really? Yes. And, and, I, and my I, friends I can, are like, and I can just see the that. I can just see the tagline now. Have you sent your payment to ISIS? <laughs> 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 right? Not exactly what you want. So not exactly what uh, you want. Bad timing on that name, but uh, yeah, they had to go back and yeah. rebrand and all. Well, that's that like the uh, that's like the one, isn't there? Like a beer or something called Corona. Yeah, it's, exactly. Uh, yes. <laughs> what are the odds? Fact, you know? I, I had a friend right. one time. He was like, I have Corona. I'm like, what? And he held, held up his beer. Right, know? right, right. You know. And I heard actually that there uh, was some like uh, blowback for that beer for a while. Last oh, year. I, I would imagine. Can you imagine when all this blew up and they were probably thinking to themselves, seriously, you couldn't have called this virus something else? You had to pick Corona? Uh, yeah, right. Oh so, man, that's funny. Anyway, yeah. So I, I I did come I came across some research that Venmo uh, came up with that I wanted to share with folks. Um, they said that um, they 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 and it's a little bit uh, skewed because it was Venmo surveying Ver, Venmo users. Right. Okay. But nearly one out of two, forty seven percent, said they would use the app at merchant checkouts if they had the option. Mm. Wow. I thought that was really significant. That is really um, significant. You know, 2020, as we've talked about a lot, was a was a unusual year. You know, it's upended so many facets of life, including banking and payments. And uh, you know, FDIC reports that a lot more people are skipping the bank and skipping the ATM and using mobile options. So, right. mobile payment, you know, is just the next logical extension. Yeah. Um, a, a couple other points from Venmo, 65% of its users are shopping more online than they did before because of COVID. Right. Uh, same about, about the same percentage, 65% said they're shopping less at brick and mortar mm -hmm. and about the same percent have placed orders for curbside pickup, which I thought was, uh, right. you know, very interesting. And here's just a, a few of the, um, co most common, um, Venmo uh, purchases, okay. what they would like to purchase with the app. What they wish they could purchase. Wish they could. Okay. Okay. Uh, clothing, shoes, and accessories. Okay. That was a hit with about 56%. Restaurants and, vi and beverages. Uh, groceries and food delivery. Okay. So, you know, that's they were asked to kind of give their top three categories, and those were the top four. Right. But, you know, I mean, I have to admit, I'm a happy Venmo user. I use I use it to pay small independent businesses if right. I can when I can, like my uh, drumming instructor, the dog's vet, some artists that I that I help you know help to sponsor. Sure. And it's really not more of a hassle for me to pull out my my mobile and click on that app than it is to pull out my wallet and right and grab a card. So for sure. And it is, and it, for most appearances, it's near instantaneous. Right now, we know on the back end it really Stop. isn't. It takes a day or Ven two. Venmo's taking on some risk, but they're making it instantaneous. But they're making it instantaneous, and uh, yeah, you know, and that's for you know for small merchants, that's a big deal. So yeah. Yeah. you know, it's, it's just out there. I, I don't think they're going to start selling merchants anytime soon. But if they're taking surveys about this, you can yeah. believe that they're thinking about they're looking it. into it. And, and you know, and again, I think kind of even from our earlier conversation about the chatbots, I mean, ultimately this comes all comes down to integration, you know, all comes down to integration. That technology is exciting because it integrates with, you know, it's a checkmate, which integrates with Clover and Paradise right. and everything else um, and Micros. And then this is interesting. Once they come out and say Venmo has now integrated with first data, right. Then it becomes a whole other thing. Right. And right. Exactly. <laughs> and then, you know, and, and you, or, or look at Zelle, which is the bank, Right. version of right. that right i mean most of those banks are already many of those banks that own zelle are also already doing business with first data so exactly it wouldn't be that big of a leap it um, would not be i have not leap. seen anything that you know direction yet but no. i will be very interested to see when it's like hey all of a sudden you can offer this and i think again it just kind of goes to a, a theme we've had in our podcast since day one is you know the payments landscape is changing and you know, this idea of being the general solution person is still possible, but mm -hmm. it's becoming, you know, there's there, I guess I would say that's fine, but now there's this whole other opportunity of becoming more of a specialist. 
Right. And um, there's people you know, that are going to chip away at your merchant base right. at our specialists. Yeah. The, the piece of the pie that's available to the generalist that's just saying, I'm going to go offer savings to everybody. Right. That piece of the pie keeps getting smaller every year as right. more and more merchants go for a specialized point of sale or a specialized, you know, online ordering, or then it's going to be a chat bot and then it's going to be, we can offer Zelle and then, you know, mm -hmm. so, so as these things come out, you know, the more specialized are increasing their market share while the more general are decreasing. Right. And so it's still possible, of course. I mean, there's a huge, huge, like, huge opportunity. Yeah. It's not like the generalists are, you know, there's just hardly anybody left to sell. There, there's still 40, 50 percent of merchants are available for that general solution. But it's just Great. that five years ago, it was 80 percent. Yeah. So where is it yeah. going to be five years from now? And do you still want to be in that slice of the general market? Or do you want to start to explore? Do you want to be the person that pioneers, you know, chatbot online ordering in your market? Or do you want to be the person that pioneers, you know, accepting Zelle when they are available to do that? You know, so I think the idea is looking at these things and constantly evaluating are there opportunities to really go after and, and kind of forge your own little slice of the market that's going to be secure for a long time to come? Yeah, and I think there's a lot of these opportunities that you know you just got to keep aware of. Yeah, I agree. Good stuff, Patty. Thanks for keeping us in the loop on that one. This episode of the Merchant Sales Podcast was brought to you by Valor Paytech, the technology company that is revolutionizing cash discounting and surcharging with innovative features like dual mid support, waive the fee options, and even adding non-cash adjustment charges to tips. Now, all of this is made possible by a variety of technology devices and solutions such as gateways, tabletop point of sale devices, and features like SMS text messaging and e-invoicing, all with cash discounting in mind. Valor Paytech, bold ideas, smart execution. Make sure you head over to ccsalespro.com slash valor, V-A-L-O-R, ccsalespro.com slash valor. Valor, V-A-L-O-R. Schedule your free demo today and watch videos and learn more about this amazing technology solution. Thank you for listening to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Whether you are an industry veteran, processing executive, or just trying to learn about the payment space, we appreciate your time. The Merchant Sales Podcast is a joint production of greensheet.com and ccsalespro.com. And we hope you will tune in next week for more information and tips on building your merchant services business.